All right, let's get started with lesson four, calorimetry. Calorimetry is an important experimental technique used in science in order to determine the amount of uh, heat loss from a system to the surroundings or the amount of heat gain from the surroundings to the system. By then, we can also determine the enthalpy change of the system by knowing the heat gained and heat loss. So, to begin with this whole idea of calorimetry, we have to introduce an important idea called the specific heat or value. This, by definition, the specific heat um, is the heat required um, to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius or by one Kelvin, either way. Um, so you got to think about this is that if you have a gram of a substance, so one gram of anything, um, the specific heat is the amount of energy that's required to raise that, the temperature of that one gram of substance by one degree C or by one Kelvin. An equation for specific heat is given down below. So the specific heat, by the way, uh, usually is symbolized by C of subscript P or just C is equal to the quantity of heat supplied divided by the mass of the object times the change in temperature and that would give us the specific heat of a particular object. Now if we rearrange that equation a bit um, that we just looked at then we can get what is called the heat transfer equation. Um, the heat transfer equation which is the amount of heat energy transferred from an object and it can be calculated using this important equation. This equation you need to have memorized and learn the, the symbols and what it means. It's a very simple equation to use but important nevertheless. Um, Q, again you already know what Q stands for is the heat transferred. M is the mass of the particular substance. C is the specific heat capacity and T, or change in T, is the change in temperature. Now, with the change in temperature, it's important to always note is that you must take the final temperature and subtract it from the initial temperature. Never the other way around. The importance of this is that by taking the temperature final minus the temperature initial, you'll get the correct um, directionality of the heat transfer. So you'll either find that the heat change is a negative or the heat change is positive. Again, the signs, as we've learned, does not mean there's a negative amount of energy. All it means is the direction that heat is being transferred. Negative uh, heat means that heat is moving from the system, away from the system to the surroundings, and with a positive heat, transfer is moving from the surroundings into the system okay so using the correct temperature relationship will allow you to get the correct sign alright now here are some values of specific heat capacities for certain materials water some metals like aluminum and copper iron brass tin and then even a uh, covalent network type of compound glass which is made up of silicon dioxide. Um, you can look and see that water has a super large specific heat um, compared to all of these other substances, um, which is 4.18, and the units is joules per gram um, Kelvin. Now, you should know the specific heat of water. You should memorize that value. It's a value that you'll use often in this class and on exams. So I just go ahead and commit that to memory. But what this is saying is, is that it's going to take 4.18 joules of energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree. That's all that is saying. And so for water it takes a tremendous amount of energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by a degree why is that? Well, it's due to hydrogen bonding. Uh, water forming those hydrogen bonds, it's going to take a lot of energy to break them. Specific heats of metals 
um, are not very high, as you can see. And why is that? Well, we know that because of the delocalized electrons that the metals have, it's easier for heat to move through metals. And that's what makes heat such, or metals such good conductors of heat, um, which is indicated by their very low specific heat capacities. All right. Uh, glass is going to have a pretty high speed, uh, specific heat capacity. Um, it's going to take a, a lot of energy to, to raise its temperature up. All right. Um, so as noted here, uh, metals have relatively low specific heats, indicating the relatively less energy is required to raise the temperature. By comparison, water, as we just talked about, has a very high sp um, 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 uh, specific heat capacity. All right. All right, so now let's get into calorimetry now that we understand um, uh, specific heat a little bit more and we understand uh, the all-important equation is the heat transfer equation. All right, and again, I'll write that the heat transfer equation quickly right here. Remember that Q heat is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. And we're going to use this uh, equation to solve many calorimetry types of problems. Um, calorimetry is an experimental technique, as was mentioned earlier, used to measure the change in energy of a chemical reaction or phase change. And usually we'll use this equation right here to help us to determine the amount of heat that is either lost or gained by the system. So there are three major steps that you need to commit to memory um, in order to solve a calorimetry problem. The first step is you're basically going to determine the amount of heat gained by a water bath using the following equation which we already know. Okay, So basically we're going to try to find out the amount of heat energy that was gained by the water using this equation. Step number two is you're going to determine the heat of the reaction by simply changing the sign um, of the amount of heat gained by the water. And this can be done because of the first law of thermodynamics and we've also addressed this in earlier lessons in this unit. So if the amount of heat um, gained um, by the water is positive, meaning that heat was transferred out of the system, out of the reaction system into water. Uh, and if we know that calculated value because of our equation up here, and all we need to do is change the sign from a positive to a negative, um, and that will just tell us exactly what the amount of heat the reaction released um, that occurred. Okay, and, and again, we will practice and work with these steps as we solve problems and actually apply these to real experimental te um, techniques. The last step is you're going to calculate the enthalpy change of the reaction. Um, and that, of course, is delta H of the reaction. And the units of delta H are going to be in kilojoules per mole. And that's important to remember. We're always going to use units of kilojoules per mole. Um, essentially, what I think you could do I, uh, to get step three is just to take delta H of the reaction and that should equal to the heat of the reaction divided by the moles and the of course the heat of the reaction right here needs to be in kilojoules so if you can remember that simple equation to find the delta H of the reaction is just simply take the heat of the reaction that was solved right here and divide by the number of moles um, in the reaction and uh, that should help you to find um, the delta H for the reaction. Right? So here is a setup for a calorimetry experiment. Um, we often use uh, styrofoam cups um, for calorimetry experiments because styrofoam is a good insulator. Uh, it keeps heat from transferring outside of our reaction 
system that we're creating here. All right, so let's go over a few principles uh, to show you um, sort of how calorimetry works. So inside of the uh, styrofoam cups, you're going to have your reaction mixture, okay, indicated by the arrow. And so in this area, this is where the reactants are. Now, outside of that, the reactants are going to be in a matrix of water. So there's going to be water in our styrofoam cup that's in contact with the reaction mixture, which is our system. So you can think of the reaction mixture, as we've talked about before, as the system, and the water is going to be the surrounding environment. We're also going to insert a thermometer into the styrofoam cup that's in contact with the water. So the thermometer and the water are going to be part of the surrounding environment. So what's going to happen is, is the reaction is going to go and happen inside of this water environment in this, in this cup. If the reaction is exothermic, then energy, heat energy, should be transferred out of the out of the um, reaction mixture and into the water and so that way the water is going to absorb uh, heat energy now what that should do is, is cause the temperature to rise of the water because the remember the thermometer is in contact with the water it's part of the surroundings so if heat energy is going into the water then the temperature of the water should increase all right. So the way to figure out um, the amount of heat energy that was transferred out of the uh, reaction mixture into the uh, water is by simply using our Q. And we're going to go Q of the water is equal to the mass. You know what I'm going to... I'm going to actually um, make this a little bit smaller so it's easier to read. You're going to take the Q of the water, and that's going to equal the mass of the water. So the mass of the water, and that should be in grams, times the specific heat of water, which you know what the specific heat of water is, because I've asked you to, to memorize it. And then remember, it's simply 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin, or Celsius, times the change in temperature. Oops, I lost my equation. All right, go back really quick. So the Q of the water, I'll just call it W, is equal to the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water, times the change in temperature of the water. We'll just use all W's for water, okay? Now, um, so that means you need to know the mass of the water that's in the container. Uh, you need to know the specific heat of water, and you need to know the temperature change. And, of course, the temperature change can be found by the change in the temperature of the thermometer. So you'll have initial temperature, and you'll have a final temperature. And like we talked about before, you'll take the final temperature and subtract it from the initial. So you'll take the change in temperature is the temperature final minus the temperature initial. And then you can just plug that into your equation and find the Q of the water. So that is step one. Step number two is to change the Q of the water. And if it's negative, let's say it's negative, so let's say it was exothermic, which we were talking about, then to find the Q of the reaction, the amount of heat that was actually lost by the reaction, oh, by the way, that's positive, sorry, because it, um, it's absorbing energy. The Q of the reaction, all you have to do is change the sign. And we can get away with this because step two applies to the first law of thermodynamics, which means that energy has to be conserved. So the energy that left the reaction is the same amount of energy that went into the water. All right? So we simply, uh, the values are equal. We just change the sign to change the direction of the flow. The third step is to find delta H for this, the delta H of the reaction. The amount, the change in enthalpy, or in other words, the change in potential energy of the system, which is equal to 
the Q of the reaction divided by the moles of the reaction mixture of one of the reactants. And usually it's the limiting reactant that we use the moles of. All right. So those are the steps in order to solve um, basically uh, the calorimetry problem here. And we'll play around with this a little bit more in class and, and show problems and, and so forth. Okay? So that is it for now. Uh, if you need to go back and relook at this lecture video, please do so. Um, study your notes really well and prepare for the quizzes.